Welcome to a tutorial on Hemingway's short stories. Um, some goals for this tutorial. Uh, we're going to review the some of the most famous Hemingway short stories, in particular The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomber, uh, his very short story, a very tip of the iceberg short story called Old Men at the Bridge, about the Spanish Civil War. Um, we're going to look at... Uh, a very bizarre story, more like an essay, called The Natural History of the Dead that establishes Hemingway's view of death at war and his philosophy that the world um, is ultimately immoral, um, humans are flawed, and therefore a need for a code. Um, and finally, we will look at uh, another imagistic um, tip of the iceberg story called After the Storm. These will all work together um, to help you understand um, really three things and that is how Hemingway wrote uh, based on his own theory the tip of the iceberg that seven-eighths of what he's really doing in the story exists beneath the surface and aren't stated in his writing but implied um, and his use of the objective correlative the idea that he was after one dominant emotion dominant impression in his extremely short stories um, well, at least the short stories of Old Man at the Bridge and After the Storm um, and we will understand Hemingway's rejection of divine providence, rejection of luck, rejection of asking for outside forces to come to one's aid, um, and the implicit need for a code, uh, and rejection of those who do not live by a code. Um, let's begin with a, with a really a fun sh a short story, a shocking story, The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomber, about Hemingway's hunting adventures in Africa. Um, and, you know, this is ripped right out of the, the biographical pages of Ernest Hemingway's life. He traveled to Africa and, as you can see in the picture, was a fan of big game hunting, not just for lions, but for buffalo, antelope, um, and many other big game animals in Africa. And he traveled often with women, Martha Gilhorn um, and his wife Mary, that he, he lived with here in Ketchum. Um, spent time with him on safaris, hunting safaris over in Africa. And so in this story, we get uh, the title, The Short Happy Life of Francis McCormick, that he actually only lived for a few brief moments when he uh, was able to, sh when Francis was able to shoot the buffalo, stand tall, um, and embrace the danger of this buffalo charging him and actually shooting him right, uh, or attempting to shoot the buffalo right in the nose, which is where you're supposed to shoot him, um, and we have, uh, you know, in this story we have uh, Margot, uh, who's a strong, beautiful woman, uh, very intelligent, who seems to be superior to everyone around them and gets what she wants. And we're going to look at this um, story through some critical lenses uh, to help you understand how literary critics um, claim authority for an interpretation. Um, in particular, the question that we're going to frame our interpretive approaches um, is, did Margot intend to kill Francis Macomber as he was shooting the buffalo? Um, was she fearful of his emerging manhood, of his emerging um, will, of his emerging confidence? And was she realizing that she could no longer control him, so she takes him out? Or was it an accident? Um, the text is ambiguous. Um, but critics are split in how to uh, in answer that question. So let's look at some quotations, I guess. Um, Refamiliarize ourselves with this story. Um, you know, opening quote begins with Margot, right? Because Margot had done the best she could for many years back, and the way they were together, both Francis and Margot, was now no one person's fault. So their relationship is um, over. Their love is over. She sleeps with Wilson the hunting guide, um, and she admits it to him uh, unapologetically, and he's humiliated by that, Francis is, and he's also humiliated by his um, cowardice in shooting the lion. Also, Francis McCumber had always had a great tolerance, which seemed the nicest thing about him, if it were not the most sinister. There's a great Hemingway comment about a man who cannot stick up for himself, who's not faithful to and in love, um, who does not... Uh, you take a clean line and end the relationship when the love is over. Um, he, he continues to tolerate uh, the injustices, the um, extramarital affairs 
that Margot has, Margot Macomber has, right under Francis's watch. And then we get to the lion. Um, he's a good lion, isn't he? Macomber said. His wife looked at him now. She looked at both of these men, both Wilson and Francis, as though she had never seen them before. As if to say, are you men for real? Are you really going to kill this lion? That's Francis McComber Lion is caught. This is after he gut shots the lion, poorly shoots him, does not get him in the heart, doesn't get him in the chest, um, and the lion goes into the bush, and he doesn't. And Francis doesn't want to follow. Um, he's laying on his cot, thinking about his cowardice, thinking about um, not wanting to go into the bush and finishing off and having the um, hunting guide, Wilson, and the porters, the supporters, the hunting supporters, um, subordinates uh, finish off his lion form. McComber lay his cob with his mosquito bar over him and listened to the night noises and it was not all over. It was neither all over nor it was it beginning. There, exactly as it happened with some of it, indelibly emphasized and he was miserably ashamed at it. But more than shame, he felt cold, hollow fear in him. So here we have a code breaker here. Um, he's ashamed. He's pitying himself. He's pitying his cowardice, fear, um, overcoming, leading to a disinclination to action. The fear was still there, like a cold, slimy hollow in all the emptiness where once his confidence had been, had been, and it made him feel sick. It was still there with him now. So here we have this great passage um, that really captures. Francis McComber as a code breaker, as one who pities himself, who doesn't have confidence in his actions, doesn't speak through actions, doesn't complete tasks well, and it ruins him psychologically inside. And the great line, we take all take a beating every day, you know, one way or the other. So we all live in lives and struggles against destruction of ourselves. It's no use in pitting ourselves or valuing somebody else's life over our own. Um, you just need to um, complete tasks well and speak through action, speak through those um, well-completed tasks. And then we have this great line from, from Wilson about uh, Francis McComber, sort of a condescending, patronizing view of McComber as a man who at you know mid-30s, 36 years old I think he is, who never really grew up. Um, it's not a matter of your 21st birthday, he goes on to say, Wilson does. It's a matter of experience and being able to show great courage and um, fearlessness um, and completing a task well. And so when Francis is able to shoot the buffalo, that's the moment where he actually lived a short, happy life in that moment, and that was all. But he said this, you know, their figures stay bullish, the American figures stay bullish when they're 50. Um, I think Wilson's a South African. The great American boy men, he says. Damn strange people. But he liked this Francis McComber now. Damn strange fellow. Probably meant the end of cuckoldry too. Meaning uh, the, the end of uh, Francis tolerating his wife cheating on him. Well, that'd be a damn good thing. Damn good thing. Beggar has probably been afraid all his life. So here's that view of um, being destroyed emotionally, psychologically, by his fear, by, being, uh, by lacking confidence. Don't know what started it. But over now, I hadn't had time to be afraid with that buff, right? So here it is, that m moment where he actually stands up, acts confidently, shoots the buffalo well. That and being angry too, motor car too, motor cars made it familiar. Be a damn fire eater now, this Macomber, right? He'd seen it in the war work the same way. More of a change than any loss of virginity, fear gone like an operation, cut the fear out of his life, something else grew in its place, main thing a man had, made him into a man, women knew it too, no bloody fear. And so here is this, you know, nice moment, I think, nice acknowledgement from Wilson that Francis McComber, through this hunting experience, like soldiers at war, um, who show grace under pressure, who show great courage and bravery when their lives are threatened, um, and it builds this self-confidence um, that can carry a man through his life. Um, and so here we have... Uh, positive view of Macomber in his short, happy life. Oop. Let me erase that. Let me take you uh, to this other quote, which is hiding down in here. This is the moment where he uh, is shooting Wilson and 
Francis and Margov jumped out of their jeeps, and they're about to shoot these charging buffalo. Wilson had ducked to one side to get in a shoulder, sh shoulder shot. Francis McComber had stood solid and shot for the nose, completing task well. And Mrs. McComber, in the car, not supposed to shoot from cars, being a code breaker here, shot at the buffalo as it seemed about to gore McComber Key line seemed about to gore McComber and hit her husband about two inches up and a little to one side at the base of. at the base of the skull. So here we have the moment that's going to um, inform our understanding or, or talk about different interpretations, and that is did Margot accidentally, it seems like from the language, formally here looking at the, the clear meaning of language, that she was trying to defend Francis McComber from being gored by the buffalo. However, there's another view that maybe she shot Francis McComber as he was emerging as a man, emerging as one who won't tolerate extramarital affairs, emerging as one who will take control of the relationship, and maybe, if she he determines she doesn't love him, leave her, and she can't, as we learn from the story, move on, because, um, in a very sexist comment, Hemingway writes that her looks are gone, and there's no one um, for Margot McComber to move on to. And so, we'll, we'll tackle that question in a second, but let's look at some of the co-principles here, right? Experiential knowledge, right? Wilson pities Francis McComber as a boy man, as an American boy man who never really developed confidence in the self, and and and, and the two other co-principles can't speak through actions, can't complete tasks well, doesn't know how to hunt, um, and is paralyzed by fear. We also have a co-principle of valuing nature, right? Wilson can't control all the extra matter affairs and all the other things that are going on during the safari, except during the hunt. They're going to hunt well. They're going to shoot animals um, out of res um, in a way that respects them and doesn't cause any necessary harm. And so clearly we have Francis McComber failing to exhibit the code principles of having experiential knowledge of being unable to speak through his actions, unable to complete tasks well, and his gut shot of the lion, unable to value nature. Um, being faithful to and in love, um, he is not faithful to his love. He's not in love with Margot anymore, but yet he hangs on out of fear of what his life will be without her. And he clearly pities himself as we saw that um, in the opening passage, opening few passages where McComber's lying on the cot wallowing in his self-pity. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple other things in this story that are important that aren't in the quotes. Um, on page 13, um, we move from the view of Macomber uh, about to shoot the lion to a view of the lion's perspective. And so it just moves very quickly from, sh from shifting perspective. Um, you don't shoot them from cars, he writes in the middle of 13. He heard Wilson saying in his ear, get out, he's not going to stay there all day. Macomber stepped out and curved of the curved opening at the side of the front seat onto the step and down onto the ground. The lion stood looking majestically and coolly down this object that his eyes only showed in silhouette, bulking like some super rhino. There was no man smell carried toward him, and, and he watched the object moving his great head a little from side to side, then watching the object, not afraid, but hesitating before going down the bank to drink with such a thing opposite him, he saw a man figure detach itself from it, and he turned his heavy head and swung away toward the cover of the trees, and he heard a crack, cracking crash, and felt the slam of a 30 out 6 220 grain solid bullet that bit his flank and ripped in sudden hot scalding nausea through his stomach. So here is being the lion's perspective of being shot by Macomber by being gut shot. He trotted heavy, big footed, swinging, wounded, full bellied through the trees toward the tall grass and cover, and the crash came to go past him, ripping the air apart. Then it crashed again, and he felt the blow as it hit his lower ribs and ripped on through. Blood sudden hot and frothy in his mouth, and he galloped toward the high grass where he could crouch and not be seen and make them bring the crashing thing, the gun, close enough so he could make a rush and get the man that held it. The next line, the next paragraph, Macomber had not thought how the lion felt as he got out of the car. So I think it's a key passage, I'm um, not going to spend too much time on it, but that we need to think about the animal's perspective here. Some find hunting to be wrong, um, but if you are going to hunt, um, there is a uh, ethical way to do it, and clearly McComber does not think about the lion, does not have courage 
to shoot the line dead on um, as a, and, and gut shots him. So that's a great moment where we see McComber's shame um, developed. One more passage. Um, you know, here we have McComber uh, having his wife uh, leave in the middle of the night and go sleep with Wilson, the hunting guide, and here's his response. Where have you been? Margo, I went out to get a breath of air. You did like hell. What do you want me to say, darling? Where have you been? Said Francis. Out to get a breath of air. Oh, that's a name for it. You are a bitch. Well, says Margo, you're a coward. All right, what of it? Nothing as far as I'm concerned, but please let's not talk, darling, because I'm very sleepy. You think that I'll take anything? I know you will, sweet. Well, I won't. Please, darling, let's not talk. I'm so very sleepy. sleepy. There wasn't going to be any of that. You promised there wouldn't be. Well, there is now, she said sweetly. So here she, here he is um, being controlled by his wife who openly sleeps with Wilson and doesn't deny it, and she knows he can't do anything about it because he's a coward, he's not faithful to love, and he pities himself too much. So those two moments show this life that Francis McComber is leading that is not a life according to Hemingway, or at least a life not worth living. Let's look at the interpretive method. So did, um, let me give some background here. Um, there are many ways to validate an interpretation that prove that one is right. Many readers ground their interpretation in the text, just looking at the language itself, formalism. Others in the author's commentary and the historical context, what Hemingway said about um, this story, and he did say many things. Others look to literary criticism about the text, right? And other texts by the same author, which is called intertextualism, um, grounding an interpretation in literary criticism. And others look at the universal archetypal principles in the text, mimeticism, and still others in the psychological effect the text has upon the reader. So really, the meaning is validated by its effect on the reader. But in the short, happy life of Francis McComber, many critics disagree about whether or not Margot intends to kill her husband at the end of the story. Hemingway says she did. And many critics say she did. So historicists that ground interpretation in what the author says, and intertextualists that ground interpretation in what literary critics say, Margo's a murderer, and she's a horrible person um, who is only out for her own self-interest. However, formalist critics looking at the language of the text indicate that the death was an accident, right? She was trying, or she was trying to defend uh, Francis from being um, gored by the buffalo. And other literary critics argue that Margo's a heroine and not the femme fatale. So formalism, intertextualism, maybe even reader response, support that Margo is to be admired and the death was an accident. So some people want and will Margot to be a heroine, will um, their desire for a strong female character in Hemingway's short story upon the story. Well, let's look at it, and you're going you're, you're gonna to debate this in an online discussion um, once you finish this tutorial on the journal questions. Um, did Mar Margot McComber intend to kill Francis McComber? Yes. Margo, and some argue, Margot intentionally shoots Francis out of fear. She will be dominated. Gonna go to the next. Dominated by him and, and jealous because he will now be able to address her faults. So she does it out of uh, selfish reasons. Here, here's, a, here's the interpretive support for that. In an interview in 1953, almost 20 years after he wrote the story, Hemingway stated that Francis' wife hates him because he's a coward, right? Because he's a code breaker. But when he gets his guts back, shooting the buffalo, she fears so much, she has to kill him. Shoots him in the back of the head. So, yeah, here we have Hemingway. I mean, case closed, right? If you're a historicist, if you're an intentionalist, that's it. Hemingway says she shot him. That's what he meant. So that's what the story means. And critics have picked up on that. Edmund Wilson stated, quote, The civilized woman despised a civilized man for his failure of initiative and nerve, and then jealousy breaks him down the minute he begins to exhibit it. So out of jealousy, out of fear of being controlled by him, Wilson and Hemingway both believe that, Fran that Margot is a murderer. Critic Nina Bain summarizes many critics who reject Hemingway as anti-woman. In this story, as an example of his demeaning view of woman as destructive, she states that many critics believe Margot commits adultery under her husband's nose and then kills him at the very moment 
when his belated entrance into manhood threatens her dominance, a feminist short story has featured this story as a leading example of the bitch stereotype. So lots of critics have said this is what makes why Hemingway's problematic, his portrayal of women as bitches, his portrayal of women as self-centered, um, his portrayal of Margot as a murderer for selfish, jealous reasons and fear of being dominated by the man. Um, she counters... So she writes, well, she, and the basic summary of her argument is that Margot was aiming at the buffalo from the car. Code breaking, not supposed to do it from a car, but she was aiming at the buffalo. Has no motive to kill Francis when the buffalo is about to do so. Right? Why not let the buffalo do it? And was blackmailed by Wilson as a murderer at the end of the story, so she will keep quiet about the illegal hunting, the hunting from cars. Margot found something to defend in Francis once he demonstrated his courage. So Margot's really trying to protect him um, from the buffalo, from his imminent death, and she's admiring him, and she really has um, no motive to kill him because maybe that's the man she always wanted. Let's look at it formally. Um, look at the language. The plain meaning of the words of the text indicate, indicates that Margot was shooting at the buffalo and that her husband stood tall to take a high shot while Wilson ducked to one side to shoot him in the shoulder. So it was an accident, since he did not expect Francis. She did not expect Francis to stay upright and take a high shot. Because he's been a coward before, he's coward, coward before, ducked before. Um, let's look at the language. Wilson had ducked to one side to get in a shoulder shot. McComber stood solid and shot for the nose, unexpectedly. And Mrs. McComber, in the car, shot at the buffalo as it seemed about to gore McComber and hit her husband about two inches up and a little to one side of the base of the skull. There it is, clear meaning of the language. Um, accident. Um, she was trying to defend him from death. And she goes on to write, Mina, the critic Nina Bain goes on to write, Margot did not shoot to kill. She shot to save her husband. And the vision of Mama Margot McComber as the bitch misrepresents her. Certainly Margot's interests coincide with those of the animals, Right. She does glare at them when they're about to shoot this lion as, are you serious? You're going to kill this majestic creature? Um, she does think about the lion's perspective. Her interests coincide with those of the animals, not with men. In shooting to save her husband, she's actually acted against her own self-interest by shooting at the buffalo. Um, but, but ultimately, she values her husband, obviously, as one would, more than um, the buffalo's life. Your, um, before we get to Old Man at the Bridge, you're going to, in your online discussion, debate that. Do you agree with the historicists and the uh, intertextualists who find that Margot is a murderer acting out of self-interest, fear of her husband's emerging masculinity and dominance, or do you agree um, with the formalists and the intertextualist critic Nina ba Bain, who argues that um, she is a heroine. Um, she's trying to defend her husband's life because this is the husband she always wanted, a man who could act with confidence, complete tasks well, who's developing experiential knowledge that will make him not an American boy man, but make him a man she would like to live with. Okay, shifting gears a little bit, we're going to look at some really, really short stories um, and uh, assess the influence of American poetic modernism upon these short stories. So here we have a Spanish Civil War short story, Old Man at the Bridge, and I want you to think about two things. How does the story achieve an objective crowd of employ the tip of the iceberg? Now you'll remember that tip of the iceberg theory is Hemingway's own, that he says that seven-eighths of what I'm trying to do in a story exists beneath the surface. Uh, you cut everything away and you just live the, you leave the tip of facts and images and dialogue and all the themes and all the ideas and philosophy is hulking underneath the surface for the reader to discover. He also was influenced by the objective Corella, if you'll recall, that's um, writing in such a way that objects, situations, events will be a formula for one particular emotion. Okay? And so he is doing both these things. He is just giving us dialogue, facts, images, and, um, the, and conveying a dominant emotion by doing so. Let's look at the story. An old man with steel-rimmed spectacles and very dusty clothes sat by the side of the road. There was a pontoon bridge across the river in carts. Trucks and men and women and children were crossing it. The mule-drawn carts staggered up the steep bank from the bridge with shoulders helping, soldiers helping push against the spokes of the wheels. 
The trucks, trucks ground up away, heading out of it all, and the peasants plodded along in the ankle-deep dust. But the old man sat there without moving. He was too tired to go any further. It was my business to cross the bridge, explore the bridgehead, so the narrator's business, beyond, and find out to what point the enemy advanced. I did this and returned over the bridge. There were so there were not so many carts now, and very few people on foot, but the old man was still there. Where do you come from? From San Carlos. That was his native town, and so it gave him pleasure to mention it, and he smiled. I was taking care of animals. Oh, I said, not quite understanding. Yes. I stayed, you see, after the evacuation orders, right? Taking care of animals. I was the last one to leave the town of San Carlos. He did not look like a shepherd nor a herdsman. And I looked at his black, dusty clothes and his gray, dusty face and his steel rim spectacles and said, What animals were they? Various animals. I had to leave them. I was watching the bridge in the African-looking country of the Ebro Delta, the Ebro River, and wondering how long now it would be before we would see the enemy, and listening all the while for the first noises that would signal that ever-mysterious event called contact. And the old man still sat there. What, an what animals were they? There were three animals all together. There were two goats and a cat, and there were four pairs of pigeons. And you had to leave them? Yes, because the artillery. The captain told me to go because the artillery. You have no family, I asked, watching, um, f watching the far end of the bridge where a few last cars were hurrying down the slope of the bank. No. Only the animals, I stated. This cat, of course, will be all right. Now he's going to repeat this phrase. A cat can look out for itself, but I cannot think what will happen to the others. What politics have you? I am without politics. I am 66 years old. I have come 12 kilometers now, and I think I can go no further. This is not a good place to stop, I said. If you, may, if you can make it, there are trucks up the road where it forks for Tortosa. I will wait a while, and then I will go. Where do the trucks go? Towards Barcelona, I told him. I know no one in that direction, but thank you very much. Thank you again very much. So very polite, very cordial. Um, he looked at me very blankly and tiredly, then said, having to share his worry with someone, the cat will be all right, I'm sure. There's no need to be unquiet about the cat. But the others? What do you think of the others? Well, they'll probably come out through this all right. You think so? Why not, I said. Watching the far bank, where now there were no carts. But what will they do under the artillery? When I was told to leave because of the artillery. Do you leave? Did you leave the Dutch dove cage unlocked? I asked. Yes. Then they will fly. Yes, certainly they'll fly. But the others, the goats. It's better not to think of the others. If you're arrested, I would go. I urged. Get up and try to walk. Thank you, he said. He got to his feet, swayed from side to side, and then sat down backwards in the dust. I was taking care of animals, he said dully, but no longer to me. I was only taking care of animals. There was nothing to do about him. It was Easter Sunday, and the fascists, the Germans, and the Italians were advancing toward the Ebro. It was a gray overcast day with a low ceiling, so their planes were not up. That, and the fact that cats know how to look after themselves, was all the good luck the old man would ever have. And so we have tip of the iceberg here, right? We have seven-eighths of the story actually happening underneath the surface. Um, but let's talk about what's on the surface. We have a man completing tasks well, speaking through actions, taking care of his animals, a man who's lost his family, that all he has left is to take care of those in his charge, and he wants to do that well. And war, the machine of war, has prevented him from doing so. He doesn't want to go get the truck. He doesn't know anybody in Barcelona. Um, he doesn't have any politics. He's not interested in resisting fascism. He's not interested in um, the Spanish cause here. He just wants the machine of war to go away. And it implies here, underneath the surface, the man is going to stay. He's going to be taken out um, by, eventually, by the advancement of the fascist movement. Um and he's going to die a miserable, horrible death. And so, let's look at some questions. Um, how does the story employ the principles of modern poetry? Specifically, direct treatment of the thing itself and images, no excessive language, and stri striving for concentration, and the objective correlative. Well, the objective correlative here, the one dominant emotion is despair, despondency. Right? The old man 
turns around and sits in the dust and accepts his fate, the unjust fate of being caught in the machine of war. We just get images of the doves flying away, of the cat moving around taking care of itself, but we also have an implied image of the goats being shot to death. Certainly symbols of innocence, like the man. How is the old man forced by the machine of war to become a code breaker, a man who cannot complete tasks well? Well, that's one of the great themes in Hemingway's war novels, that war, um, while bringing life and death close together and providing some moments for those to act nobly and courageously and fearlessly, often Hemingway captured moments in war where one cannot, um, by the retreat in Caporetto and Farewell to Arms, um, cannot complete the task well. And... Um, fails to follow that code principle and can't speak through actions. Why is it significant that it was Easter Sunday? Obviously, Easter Sunday is a is um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, and those who have faith in Christ will have eternal salvation. It's um, highly ironic, right? Here we have this man accepting his fate, um, knowing that he we know as reader he will be killed um, mercilessly, um, and we know there is no salvation for him. He has no politics. He also has no religion. Um, all he has is the ability to have faith in himself and completing tasks well, and war has taken that. How does the old man become the cat in the repetitions of the phrase, cats can look out for themselves? Well, he was looking out for himself. He was able to live a dignified life, but the war has taken that away from him. Finally, denying a providential universe, the narrator claims that the low ceilings of clouds and the cats, not, the cats know how to take care of themselves, the only luck, quote-unquote, the old man will have. What is Hemingway saying about the old man and the goat's fate, God and providence? Well, um, he's saying there is no luck, there is no God, there is no divine providence, God's will in the world. There is only your will, the individual will in the world. And in this modern era, right, World War I, Hemingway saw this, shot himself in war, and now in the Spanish Civil War, precursor to World War II, and again in World War II, he saw um, that there is no outside force helping one in moments of despair, in moments of imminent death. Um, there is only the individual will, and here his, this man, old man's will has been taken from him. Great story for conveying uh, his principle of tip of the iceberg and how he conveys the emotion of despondency in... Um, very short, concentrated images and facts of a retreat during the Spanish Civil War. Well, here's a horrifying image for you, The Natural History of the Dead. This is a story that Hemingway, uh, it's more like an essay than it is a story, but it's important understanding Hemingway's view of war. And so he's going to apply a naturalist's view of dead bodies on a battlefield how they bloat, how their skulls are blown to fragments with hair still in them, um, how they expand beyond their capacity of their clothes, how there's letters everywhere. Um, he, uh, like a naturalist would describe a landscape or an ecosystem, um, Hemingway takes the sort of nat his love of nature and being a naturalist and he applies it to dead on a battlefield so the reader can see the horrors of war firsthand. Here's some quotes for you. Arriving where the munition plant had been, some of us were put to patrolling about those large stocks of munitions where for some reason had not exploded, while others were just as put at extinguishing a fire which had gotten into the grass of an adjacent field, which task being concluded, we were ordered to search the immediate vicinity and surrounding fields for bodies. We found and carried to an imp improvised mortuary a good number of these, and I must admit, frankly, it was a shock to find these, d these dead were women rather than men. So here you have innocence caught up in war. Um, maybe some of these women were um, conscribed to fight in the war, but many were not. In those days, women not yet commenced to wear their hair cut short, as they did several, for several years in Europe and America. And the most disturbing thing, perhaps because it was the most unaccustomed, was the presence, and even more disturbing, the occasional absence of this long hair. And so you'd see this long hair attached to skull fragments, or even skull fragments without any hair at all. Brutal image um, that Hemingway's sharing with us. 
I remember that after we had searched quite thoroughly for the complete dead, we collected fragments. Many of these were detached from a heavy barbed wire fence which had surrounded the position of the factory and were still ex existent portions of which we picked many of the detached bits which illustrated only too well the tremendous energy of a high explosive. Many fragments, these are skull fragments, right? We found a considerable distance away from in the fields. They've been carried farther by their own weight. So here's what it looks like when bombs explode, grenades explode. Um, when... Um, planted bombs in the field explode and send fragments of the bodies abroad. A naturalist, to obtain accuracy of observation, that's what he's doing, he may confine himself to his, in his observations to one limited period, and I will take first that following the Austrian, Austrian offensive of June 1918 as one in which the dead were present in their greatest numbers. So here we have a view of World War I. Withdrawal having been forced in advance later made to recover the ground loss so that the positions after the battle were the same as before except the presence of the dead. So nothing gained but much lost here in the presence of the dead. A couple more. Until the dead are buried, they change somewhat in appearance each day. The color change in Caucasian in white race is, is from white to yellow to yellow-green to black. If left long enough in the heat, the flesh becomes to resemble coal tar, especially where it had been broken or torn, and it was quite a visible tar-like iridescence. The dead grow larger each day until sometimes they become quite, quite too big for their uniforms, filling these until they seem to blow tight enough to burst. The individual members may increase in girth to an unbelievable extent, and faces fill as taut and globular as balloons. So here we have the accuracy of observation of a naturalist upon the bloating color-changing bodies of dead soldiers. The surprising thing next to their progressive corpulence, the bloating, is the amount of paper that's scattered about the dead. The ultimate position before there is their ultimate position before there's any question of burial on the location of the pockets in their uniform. In the Austrian army, these pockets were in the back of the breaches and the dead after a short time all consequently lay on their faces. They've been flipped over. The two hip pockets pulled out by scavengers by the enemy and scattered around them in the grass. All those papers their pockets that contained the heat, the flies, the indicative positions of their bodies in the grass, the amount of paper scattered are the impressions one retains, the smell of a battlefield in a hot weather one cannot recall. You can remember that there was such a smell, but nothing ever happens to you to bring it back. There is no other smell like it in the world to remind you of these decaying, bloated bodies with their papers... Um, their letters home to their wives, to their families, to their children, strewn about. Some more on death at war. The first thing you found about the dead was that it hit badly enough they died like animals. Some quickly from a little wound you wouldn't think would kill a rabbit. So death can happen quickly from a small bullet. They died from little wounds as rabbits die sometimes from three or four small grains of shot that hardly seem to break the skin. Others would die like cats, a skull broken in, and iron in the brain. They lie alive two days like cats that crawl into the coal bin with a bullet in the brain and will not die until you cut their heads off. Maybe cats do not die then. They say they have nine lives. I do not, I do not know, but most men die like animals, not men. And so most men die at war here um, like rabbits. Tiny little wounds take them away quickly. Then there's this horror of dying slowly over multiple days. The only natural death I've seen outside of loss of blood, which isn't bad, was death from Spanish influenza, um, which got the soldiers as well. And this, you drown in mucus, choking, and you know when the patient's dead is. At the end, he turns to be a little child again, though with his manly force, and fills the sheets as full as any diaper with one vast final yellow cataract that dribbles on after he's gone. So if the war doesn't get you, if the bomb, bombs don't get you, the grenades, the explosive devices planted in the ground, then the influenza will get you, um, or the cholera will get you. It was not always hot weather for the dead. Much of the time it was the rain that washed them clean when they lay in it. It made the earth soft when they 
were buried in it, and sometimes then kept on until the earth was mud and washed them out, and you had to bury them again. Or in the winter mountains, you had to put them in the snow, and when the snow melted in the spring, someone else had to bury them. So there's this continual burial of the dead. They keep emerging to remind man here of what he's up to um, with this uh, natural history of the dead. But I want to share with you one quote that I didn't bring in um, to the tutorial, and that is the opening quote about divine providence. Um, he's got this quote from Mungo Park. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm quoting here. Mungo Park was at one period of his course fainting in a vast wilderness of the African desert, naked and alone, considering his days as numbered, and nothing appeared to him remain for him to do but lie down and die. A small moss flower of extraordinary beauty caught his eye. Through the whole plant, he says he, was no larger than, though the whole plant was no larger than one of my fingers, I could not contemplate the delicate conformation of its roots, leaves, and capsules without admiration. Can that capital B being God, who planted, watered, and brought to perfection in this obscure part of the world, a thing which appears so of so small importance, look with unconcern upon the situation and suffering of creatures formed after his own image? Surely not, says Mungo Park. Reflections like these would not allow me to despair. I started up, says Mungo Park, and disregarding both hunger and fatigue, traveled forward, assured that relief was at hand, and I was not disappointed. And so here we have... Um, this unwavering faith in divine providence that God made man in his own image will not let man die a miserable death when he, you know, he applies such, such beautiful intricacy to a small moss plant, moss flower. Um, and clearly Hemingway is mocking that. He lists the second paragraph of this story and the rest of the story is all about death coming quickly. Um, tiny little fragments can kill men like animals. Um, also, men will die over multiple days, or you will die from influenza in, in an undignified way. Death will come at war, um, and there is no outside influence to prevent it. So here we have, let's look at some of the questions. You know, what is the message of Mungo Park's apotheosis about Providential Universe in his seemingly last moments before death, and how did it allow him to persevere? Um, he believes in this outside influence, and that gives him strength. Whereas for Hemingway, the only strength one can have is through your own will, and often war takes away your ability to will yourself in the world. Applying a naturalist attention to detail and proclivity to cataloging, labeling, and identifying the, to the dead at war, Hemingway recalls us back to the mules of the Greek evacuation of Turkey in the key at Smyrna. What does the narrative Hemingway conclude from this? Um, he concludes, one could argue, and from the Greek evacuation of Turkey, is that war forces man to do immoral things, horrible things to other men, and that death is final, and death comes and often in an undignified way. Others. What is the effect of the accurate observation of the dead after the Austrian offensive of June 1918? The skin goes yellow, green, black, bodies bloat, to bursting point papers everywhere, heat flies. Um, he wants to show you, like modern poets do, like uh, the Emperor of Ice Cream, what death actually looks like without qualification, without um, his own emotions projected onto it, so the reader can see what is actually there and feel what they should feel had they been there and seen it themselves. Why refer to man as dying from little wounds and then show a natural death from the flu as drowning in mucus with one last cataract of yellow that dribbles on after one is gone? To show you the horrors of death, the reality of death, and that war, um, more often than not, leads to this type of death. And it ends with this little um, story, or vignette, where a badly wounded man with a broken skull um, is unable to be helped by the doctor. Um, and um, What is the significance of the badly wounded man with a broken skull and the doctor's refusal to help? Well, the doctor is, is trying to do the best he can to save the lives of the men before him. He doesn't have time to go outside and help the man with a broken skull. The doctor knows that man is going to die, um, and he, the doctor sprays iodine in the soldier, the pleading soldier's eyes because 
that pleading soldier doesn't get that this death death is coming, death is real, and he's doing the best he can situation. So a really sharp, um, accurate, naturalistic view of death at war, and this is an important story for us to understand Hemingway's view of war as a place that more often than not robbed an individual of his dignity, robbed an individual of the ability to complete tasks well, um, while, in the same breath, um, war provided a mom, sometimes moments for individuals to be coded, to, to, um, in, to project their will into the world and to act nobly. But here we have the overwhelming context of death at war as ignoble, um, as horrifying, and the crowd of emotion is um, despondency. One question. Let's look at the final story, which is After the Storm. Um, the same question I, I had for Old Man at the Bridge applies to After the Storm. How is it tip of the iceberg writing, and how is it achieve the objective correlative? You know, here we have a story, just to remind you, where this man's in a, in a bar fight. He doesn't know why. He has to cut the man's arm um, in order to release himself um, from the fight. And he goes out after this, this hurricane to discover this um, steamship, this passenger steamship that's been... Um, so, that was hit a sandbar and sunk and 400 people died and he's going out there to see if he can get some loot, some goods from the ship. Um, but let's look at some of the questions. So, how does the opening fight highlight the disconnect between men and men and male relationships as a failed end of the despair? You know, here he is, drinking too much in a bar and getting in a fight over something he can't even remember that he's ultimately jailed for when he was really just trying to defend himself. So there's no um, connection between men and men, um, uh, and often, uh, at least in Hemingway's world, it led to violence um, and uh, despair. And so, how is the description of the key after the storm, of the water white as chalk, the whole trees and dead birds floating all around, all the pelicans in the world in safe harbor inlet, an objective color for two emotions? Um, well, peace and tranquility that the birds have found inland, they know when a storm comes where to go and get harbor. And the, and the implication here is that man does not know where to go when the storms of life come. What is delayed decoding and how does he use it um, when he sees the birds eating pieces of things near the wreck? Well, he sees these birds working. He knows that's probably where the wreck is. There's probably some food or something floating in the surface and that's why the birds are there. Um, when he gets closer, he realizes it's actually flesh. Um, like Natural History of the Dead, here we have a brutal view um, that um, these people have been blown to bits and the birds are eating them. By shifting the focus to the narrator and the narrator's psychological mindset, how does despair and depression become the focus of the story, not the obvious despair of the drowned on the ship and the resulting depression of their loved ones, how is Hemingway conveying the ubiquity of despair here? Well, this um, narrator, obviously after the fight in the bar, can't find any solace there, any antidote to despair there, in drink or in male relationships, tries to get rich quick, tries to get down to the ship and break through the glass so he can find some of the money and the goods in the ship, and he can't, doesn't have the right tool to break the glass, the, the wrench falls into the sand, um, and then the Greeks come later and they blow the ship up with dynamite and they get all the all the goods um you know clearly 400 people dead their families mourning them and then and then this individual unable to have any success in any of his endeavor, endeavors just underscores the despair what is significant about the narrator is inability to access the woman with her hair floating all about he sees her in the in the boat window in the context of the fight between men in the opening paragraph well um you know, it's important here that that's just a detail, just an image of this dead woman, the hair floating about, and him tapping on the pane of the glass, trying to break it with his wrench, and he can't get to her. He doesn't have the tools to get to her. Doesn't, and there's that disconnect between men and women in a lot of his stories. Why is it significant that the narrator does not have the right equipment to get to the woman and the $5 million in the ship? And then what does it mean the Greeks have the dynamite to strip her clean? Should he envious means of getting rich? Well, lots of questions there, but... Um, clearly, he can't get to the woman, he can't get to the $5 million, and no, the reader doesn't admire this get-rich-quick scheme, um, and knows this man needs to find something to do with his life that will 
um, give him some sustenance, give him some meaning, and some means to support himself. In the same vein, what do we learn about the institution of society as an antidote to despair? We discover that Nader has been placed in jail for self-defense. So he's been placed in jail, and then the next question, he gets bailed out of jail because his friends claim that the narrator, that, uh, that the man in the bar was after him with an axe, which is a lie. Um, and so this, the narrator knows that the police are corrupt, the justice system's corrupt, the lying of his peers is a, is a sh show of corruption, so it adds to his despair of the world. Well, the question about the auto, having the, the steamship pilot having the, um, captain having the uh, steamship on an autopilot and not knowing the region well enough underscores the code principle of experiential knowledge and this idea that machines now um, are have this capacity of autopilot and there's a loss of human skill in navigation and that led to 400 deaths, 400 innocent deaths. Um, and the end of the story, why end with the birds got more out of her than I did? Nature knows how to take a safe harbor. Nature knows how to gain sustenance from storms. Um, man is the one who sticks out here, has un unable to find meaning in life, unable to um, find peace and a harbor when storms, emotional storms, psychological storms come. So what emotions in you, the, are, are in you, the reader, after the storm? How did the event, the images, the dialogue, the interior monologue result in a correlative emotion? Right here's the objective correlative. Um, we're left uh, sad, I think, um, um, despondent, if you will, um, about this man's predicament and, uh, and left without hope, sort of bereft, without hope this man will find uh, meaning in his life. Um, he's a code breaker, uh, he's a get-rich-quick schemes, his failure to access women, his failure to um, interact with men in a positive way, um, his rejection of the institutions of society, um, it all lead to this man's disbelief in the goodness of the world. Um, and again, all of this is context for After the Storm, Old Man at the Bridge, Natural History of the Dead, Francis McComber, of the need for a code, a need for a self-imposed way of conducting yourself in the world so you can get strength from that, so you can get confidence from that, and so that you have a strong will in the world. Um, I look forward to reading your online discussions about uh, Francis McComber, um, and I hope these stories help you understand the great novels coming up in the course, Farewell to Arms, Sun Also Rises, For Whom the Bell Tolls, An Old Man at the Sea.